So welcome everyone, and um, thank you for joining us uh, for today's webinar. Before I pass you over to Nikita, I just wanted to introduce myself and um, the LinkedIn group which the uh, webinar is being presented through. So I'm Nina, the um, group manager for the LinkedIn group HR Users of Psychometrics. As you may know, we have recently introduced these webinars to the group, and this is because we have over 5,000 members um, with a wealth of expertise and knowledge, so it would be a shame not to share that um, knowledge with everyone else, really. So if you are interested in conducting the webinar, then please do get in touch with me. Okay, lovely. So right, I'm just going to pass you over to Nikita now, who will talk about uh, personality dynamics. Okay, well, thank you so much for that. So. As we continue, I just, next slide. Okay, great. So personality dynamics, oh, it's nothing new. To me, a quote of William Shakespeare summarizes quite well. I could be well moved if I were as you, but I'm as constant as a Northern star. Some people might not be as dynamic as others. So what about me? Here's a bit of narcissism. I'm a psychometrician qualified in a variety of tools, personality, situational judgment, ability, etc. Use them for years in selection and development, individuals and teams. And I love what I do. And considering I'm low on conscientiousness, that's a must. So I'm also high on neuroticism, extroversion, openness, and I'm also low on agreeableness. So this is probably one of the reasons I have quite an unemployable portrait for somebody in the corporate. So this is why I'm an independent consultant. Play to your strengths, I believe it's called. So what are the aims of this session? Um, okay, so we've got a message saying you have no sound. Can we just check there is sound coming from other people? Um, can you write in the chat feature if you can hear what I'm saying now? I can hear, I can hear. Okay, lovely. So um, Chris, Hi, it may be that um, there's something on your computer settings which uh, is enabling you to um, listen to it, but uh, we'll record it and send it afterwards, so don't worry. Okay. okay, wonderful. So what are the aims of the session? So to share with you what I'm finding in the literature, um, also how can this be used in practice, and here are your thoughts on the matter. As was said, there's over 5,000 practitioners who are on the LinkedIn group, and we have a dozen people here, so it would be a shame if we don't share our experiences together. And please note that these might change as the webinar progresses. So what do we mean by personality first and foremost? So I quite like the American Psychological Association definition. The unique psychological qualities of an individual that influence a variety of characteristic behavioral patterns, both overt and covert across different situations and over time. And to me, one of the examples that I give in practice of personality is that I take off my glasses and I say that actually a difference of personality might indicate you're seeing the world in different light. So whenever somebody is maybe slightly upsetting you or their behavior is a bit misunderstandable, you need to ask them why they're doing something and not attribute motive because they might be just acting on very different preferences to you and not aware that this is upsetting you. And I'm a bigger fan of traits, uh, so stable and lasting patterns of preferences, though I'm also not averse to type. To me, type uh, has a, a beautiful indication of dynamics and considering there's a lot of people who've done type tools again and again in their lives, Ask them if the letters have changed, because it's not it's something to be investigated in the feedback session. Some letters are stable. That means their personality is more stronger that way, and, and those types are more prevalent. And the letters which change, that means it's more flexible, given the situation. So it's worth asking, like, well, if your letters change, then what was happening with you? What was different? It's actually something to be investigated. Um, personal model of choice is five, so big five, of course. So I'm sure you're familiar with the song three is a magic number. I say, no, it's five. Five is the magic number. How many times do I have to tell you this? So what, which five do we mean? So it's openness, 
So the tendency to proactively seek and appreciate new experiences, ideas, actions, and even foods. And recent studies show which, uh, because I love the big five, because then I can binge on Google Scholar. You can just type in anything that I care about and pop, presto, it comes out. So a recent study done with openness on the neuroscience perspective, it seems that people high on openness have more connections between the hemispheres. So it's not the question of left versus right, it's actually how many connections you have between them, which seems to be correlated with openness, which is quite curious. Then you have conscientiousness, strength and purpose and willpower. And to me, conscientiousness is basically willpower. It's sacrificing a small reward now for a bigger one later. And there's been a really cool study in behaviors and Big Five in 2017, which shown uh, that people high on conscientiousness don't sleep past 12. So I'm low on conscientiousness and I often do that. So prove the model as far as I'm concerned, supports it. Then you have the extroversion, levels of energy and positivity. On extroversion, introversion, I cannot recommend highly enough a book by Susan Cain, uh, Quiet. The power of introverts in a world that can't stop talking. If you, if you have some late Christmas gifts or New Year's gifts, and some of your colleagues are more introverted than extroverted, get them this book, probably some of the best 10 pounds you'll ever spend. And then you have agreeableness, attitude towards people and relationships. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting social one. People high on agreeableness, you quickly know them. When you ask them how they are, within 10 seconds, you're talking about how somebody else is. And then you have neuroticism, the perception of threat and risk, as well as intensity of negative emotions and thoughts. Yeah, um, um, yeah, perception of risk is definitely there. And um, also potential bias towards negative stimuli. You might be telling somebody who's higher on neuroticism all the right things they've done in the last year, all the goodness for like half an hour. Then you mention some things they can interpret as slightly negative, and they act like you insulted the very core of their being. And you're just like, what the hell, man? Well, it's probably an indication they're a bit neurotic. For them, the very good recommendation is for them to have a nice breakfast, like a proper breakfast and a fatty one. None of that high carbs, low fat rubbish. No, like proper breakfast, you know, avocados, bacon, all that good stuff. Because it's actually likely to temper your nervous system response and your stress response during the day. And then some people, neuroticism might be connected to things like insulin levels. And insulin levels don't reset until you go to sleep. So if you miss breakfast, some people can't catch up for their emotional well-being. So the main thing is have breakfast. Everybody should have breakfast. But people with neuroticism should especially have breakfast because they're the most likely to miss it. So just as a little pointer. Then what is the status quo on personality? Historically, organizations and personality psychologists have ignored those individual variations in personality across situations and have treated it as measurement error. So your personality changes now, a little bit later, uh, you take an assessment in a year, it changes, and we say, well, it's test, retest, man. It's, 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 there's nothing there. Well, actually, there might be a lot of things there that your personality has changed, and we shouldn't have, uh, we shouldn't throw it away. Um, and I believe it was Costa and McRae that said that personality is, is set as plaster. And we do know that from 18 to 30, your personality changes quite a bit, and from 50 to 60 as well. But it doesn't mean it cannot change from 30 to 40. It, it might become just a little bit less elastic, so to say. So potentially personality dynamics can also explain, well, why are the correlations so low when it would come to criterion validity? If personality is this important, well, why do we find like correlation between personality and performance of being like 0.4? And the correlation of 0.4, all this means if we take two people, we give them a big five questionnaire, we find that performance is correlated by 0.4 with their conscientiousness. We take a 0.4, we square it, we get 0.16. This means that 16% of variance in performance between these two individuals can be explained by the difference in conscientiousness, which is not a lot. But maybe it's the personality dynamics which goes to a way to explain why it might happen. And again, nothing new. A guy called Michel in 1968 indicated that maybe our behaviors are influenced more by situations rather than we are willing to admit.
and the times they are a changing. There's new constructs emerging in the last 10, 15 years. So first one I want you to uh, pay attention to is called trade activation theory, which is a build up on job for, uh, person fit. So how, how well does a person fit the job? But, you know, what do we mean by person? This zooms in a lot more. So it looks at individual traits and aspects. So to what extent they are required by the job demands? So to what extent your job actually requires for you to show those traits? So, for example, if you're an accountancy, it's more about conscientiousness and orderliness on the neo, because you need to be organized and we don't want creative accountants. So then you have situational strength, which is implicit or explicit cues provided by external entities regarding the desirability of potential behaviors. And this is proposed by Myers. Uh, so basically it's to what extent you feel the situational demands are stronger or weaker. So for example, it doesn't matter what your conscientiousness is to start with. If you think there's a risk, your conscientiousness increases. So maybe this is why low conscientious people are so responsive to deadline. It's not the actual deadline which is driving performance. It's the risk of what will happen if the deadline is missed. So like my... Dear colleague Stuart Dessen always says, if I want to tell, uh, get Nick to do something, I just tell him about the risks and it always works, which is true. And then we have personality strengths. So Delal et al. in 2015 said, well, you know, this old situational strength is all well and nice, but actually what about personality strength? And this is not to be confused with strength, plural, which is all about like play to your strengths and all this. No, this is separate. It's called personality strength. The forcefulness of implicit or explicit internal cues regarding the desirability of potential behaviors. So, for example, maybe if you're one percentile in conscientiousness, it's harder for you to be conscientious even when there are cues rather than if you're 50th percentile conscientiousness. Hope it making sense so far. So, we've taken a more dynamic approach to personality. Uh, Judge and Zapata 2015 did a nice meta-analysis on lots of studies and they found that the big five is more predictive of performance in situations with weak situational strengths. So the employee has discretion at making decisions. So the more freedom you have, the more you can act on it. I read recently a study on blog writing and like a correlation between openness and blog writing is like 0.7, 0.8. Compare that to 0.3, 0.4 for performance at work. So actually our personality shapes our actions outside of work when we have freedom of actions by the looks of it much more than when we have strong situational demands. And specific traits also predict performance in jobs that activate particular traits, such as openness for jobs requiring innovation. So if you're working in a very structured environment where you don't have a lot of chance to be creative, it's unlikely openness will be correlated with performance in this job. But if you're working as an artist or a creative, as inverted commas, it's probably quite important. So it's to be conscious of that. So how can we change our personality? And this is a very interesting new area which is emerging. So for example, Roberts et al. 2017. By the way, you will get all these references at the back of the presentation. So you can just type into Google Scholar and pretty much all of them are available on, to access. So therapy decreases neuroticism and increases extroversion. Hey, who knew therapy decreases your negative emotional state and increases your positive emotional state? So therapy works, uh, so the evidence is there. Um, retirement, interestingly enough, increases in openness and agreeableness. So maybe if we're taken out of a corporate environment, we can be all nice and fluffy and open to experiences, which is quite curious. And, I'm not sure anybody takes this into account in retirement planning. And uh, just recently read a study on the, on the train here is that also unemployment seems to be affecting people. They're also become slightly more agreeable uh, for the first couple of years. And uh, though it's not straightforward relationship and it can, there's other mediators we're becoming aware of, like your genetics might be playing a part to what extent actually is that personality change interventions might work or not. And the beauty of using the big five is that we know it's rooted in your genetics. 
um, like for example, and it, it, there's really like funky ways it's rooted, like some of the big five genetics uh, sit on the same alleles as stuff for personality disorders, which gives a whole new tint to DSM-5 and the dimensional personality disorder approach, but that, that's a whole different kettle of fish, and I'm happy to talk about it if somebody wants to talk over Skype or a coffee. Though there's interesting developments happening. So, how can we use it in practice? Well, let's start from the get-go. I don't know when you're using psychometrics, but when I have used them in the past, I used to hate this question. You sit down with your coachee and they go, oh, well, and you ask, how was the psychometric for you? And they say, well, you know, I wasn't sure, you know, is it my home self or my work self? You know, how does this work? And before I was like, well, 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 you know, we, we ask a range of questions and I was trying to defend the tool and the assessment and myself. And now I realize the fact they're asking me this question, they have the awareness, they're two different people. Like they, they have, their personality is so different between those two contexts that they're asking you this question. And actually the fact when this is question is asked to me is far more interesting than any psychometric result. Because then you can ask them, well, how is it different? Why are you asking me this question? You know, when are you more yourself? Because some people are more at home themselves than at work. And some people are more at work than at home. So we shouldn't be taking that for granted as well. So if they don't ask you this question, doesn't matter what tool you're using, there are still other questions you can ask, such as I found in the past, one of my favorite has been is, it's about halfway through the session. You introduce them to the model, they already get a grasp of their results. And you say, well, what aspects of personality do you consciously manage at work? And why do you feel it's necessary to do so? And surprisingly enough, Everybody from a graduate to a CEO manages something about themselves, which they're aware of. It's kind of almost freaky that it, it's everybody. Uh, and it's really interesting, the answer, because this gives you a good indication of uh, job-to-person fit or trait activation and also the energies they're using. And also, then you can follow on with like a question, when was the last time you did not manage it as well as you wanted to? Because that might happen like person missed breakfast or didn't have a snack or like went into a meeting at five o'clock after they've been networking all day and they're quite introverted, so they just shut down. Stuff like that. Uh, it might be also give us indication of how they might want to manage it better in the future or if they want to continue manage it or they might want to release more of their real self bit by bit. Then you can ask, for example, when was the last time you acted out of character? That's also a funny thing we have in the English language from a psycho, uh, psycho, uh, psycho lexical perspective. Like, why do we have act out of character? Because we can all act out of this scheme of who we think we are. So when was the last time you did this? How did it look like? What triggered it? In what way was it so different from your usual behavior that you think you, it was out of character? Then you can follow on, you know, how often is this happening? Has it started happening more often, etc.? And that could be quite interesting. And then, of course, you can always ask like a, a little coaching question. If there were three things about your personality that you could change, what would they be? Why do you want to change it? And will it serve you in the short term or long term? Because short term might be effective, but it might be counterproductive long term. So it's important to ask and reflect. And just as a few words of caution, there's research coming out from Cambridge. I only found it in the NY mag. Hopefully soon we'll have a peer-reviewed paper coming out uh, that looks at physical changes if you manage your personality too much. So it looked like if you're really introverted and you really act extroverted, that uh, you have, uh, and vice versa, um, it affects you physically, like your blood pressure goes up, heart rate, etc. It affects you on a physiological level. So there is something to be said about authenticity and pursuing your interests. And what else, what else did that, did I miss through this one? Yeah. So Boyce Wood and Paut Javi uh, have a very good study in 2013. And the summary is we find that personality changes at least as much as economic factors and relates much strongly to life satisfaction. Our results therefore suggest that personality can change and such changes are important and meaningful. And uh, it is. 
though as practitioners, I also feel what's really important for our clients to understand is that personality is changeable. There is a good study from the States, which is coming out soon, uh, is they gave personality assessments to kids, teenagers, I believe. And uh, they, one group was told that personality is changeable and the other one wasn't. And this, they also completed the, like a depression anxiety questionnaire. And they found out that the group who was told personality is changeable, a year later were like 30% less depressed than the person than the group who wasn't told this. So even actually telling our clients that personality is changeable and it is malleable is actually potentially worthy in itself. So I just want you to think about that if you can. So just to go out of space for a second, to me, a good metaphor of our previous psychometric thinking is was like this. I'm sure some of you recognize Jupiter. I think this was the first picture ever taken of it. And uh, we can see it's a planet, we can see there's belts, can, but it's static. We don't see the movement. It's not even factored in. However, if we, ah, it doesn't work on this, ah, here it is. Ah, fantastic, so it does work. But however, when we look at the dynamics, we can see how everything changes. We can see the dynamics between the belts, same as we can see the dynamics between the big five. And it's in those dynamics, it's really curious. I'm sure as if all of you who love psychometrics as much as I do, when you pick up a new manual for a new tool, you immediately go into the correlations between the factors. Like, you know, why, why is neuroticism negatively correlated with extroversion and positively with openness? It's all indication of those dynamics. It's that, uh, it, but no tool quite illustrates this as, as much as possibly could do in the future. But I think it's really exciting to be here and now where we start looking at personality in a whole new light. And just to say that there's new tools coming to the market and which are starting to embrace this. And I'm sure this is not the only one, but this is the one I'm aware of. So if any of you are aware of any other tools which take a dynamic perspective, please let me know. I'm fascinated by the topic. So the way that this tool called Luminous Spark takes into account, it measures what's called the three personas, or as personality dynamics. I love this little cartoon in the corner. No, I do not have multiple personalities, just one that's very, very complicated. So Luminous Spark is a new instrument. We also have an app, which is pretty cool and it animates your personality, which is pretty funky. So what is the model? The model was created across a study in Japan, Canada, UK, and US in 2009 through asking thousands of people hundreds of bimodal big five questions. So for example, measuring extroversion, introversion separately. Based on the analysis of this data across nationally, the model has emerged. It consists of 144 items, which measures the 24 qualities on the outside be demonstrative or measured, each one of those is measured <clears throat> with six items. So hence, six by 24, 144. The positioning, however, is based on correlations within the data. So whether you go to Japan or Canada, if you're highly demonstrative and you tell people, like to tell people how you feel, you're least likely to be poker-faced and measured and hold back. And if you like to tell people how you feel, you're more likely to take charge and actually tell them and be sociable, find people to tell them. And if you take charge, you're more likely to be tough. And so it goes. But some people can be high demonstrative, high take charge, high competitive, low tough. They want power, not comfortable with conflict. I'm pretty sure you have coaches like this. And so some people might be highly flexible and structured. So I had a client a couple of weeks ago and I said, how does this work? You like to be really structured and organized and you also likely to go with the flow. He says, Nikita, simples. I keep a very detailed diary and agenda, but I keep it in pencil. So people combine it in different ways. We're all special and we're all messy when it comes to personalities and we're all unique. And of course, some of you might remember Monty Python. I'm not, but that's a different thing. Uh, and then what we have is we factor analyze the data. We found the big five, we found the big two, and we found the big one. So if we go to here, we can see also the hypothetical mapping onto type-based tools. So we park neuroticism for now and don't measure it directly. But here you have high agreeableness, people focus, outcome focus, low agreeableness, extroversion, introversion, openness we call big picture, low openness down to earth, high conscientiousness, 
is discipline driven, low conscientiousness is inspiration driven. So it's all nicely mappable. So we're doing some studies to see how we did studies on the big five. We're doing studies on other tools and other models. So we'll keep you posted if you wish. So how does it do it? It's not rocket science. So we measure the underlying. So out of this 144 items, a third of the items starts with what you like, what you enjoy, such as, I really enjoy working collaboratively with others, or winning is important to me. So it's more about preference than behavior. Every day is more about what you actually do, such as I always acknowledge the contributions of others, or I often outperform my colleagues. And overextended, you say, well, when you don't do yourself too many favors, such as I'm so modest, my achievements can be overlooked, or at times I'm so focused on winning that I lose sight of other people's needs. Well, I'm high on competitive, so I say it's other people's problems, right? Uh, <clears throat> anyways, uh, so, and at the bottom, we can see a demonstration of this. So each one of the levels or personas is measured uh, with uh, separate items and normed separately. So underlying, we can see this person is equally as collaborative as competitive or around like 60 or 70 percentile. Every day they play more towards their collaborative side and they don't actually show their competitive spirit and overextend that they go quite collaborative, but at the same time, potentially, potentially, their competitive picks up as well. But that might be measurement there, it's tiny here. Uh, but that's something to explore. It's like under stress, they want to preserve peace, but they also want to win. So potentially that might be causing them a bit of conflict. So how to apply this? So underlying here, you see me sitting on the mountain. I'm quite happy looking at the distance because I'm quite high on openness. I like to do what I like, quite extroverted and outcome focused, not particularly agreeable. And I like to have a bit of time to reflect for myself. And underlying is what you like. It's your trait, it's your being, whatever you want to call it, the authentic self or even private self, because it, you might not show it because we might not get to do what we like. So then we have every day. So it's more about behavior, your public self, the self you want approval for. So every day, you know, I try to be less big picture, try to be slightly disagreeable and a bit more agreeable. And it's really hard for me because I'm so naturally pulled towards outcome focused and get in my own way. So this little bit of agreeableness, though people high on agreeableness probably st still see me as a selfish git. Uh, um, I'm really trying. And then overextended, I just go all over the place. It's a maladaptive or overdoing. Um, this is who you are under pressure, the stress self. You may be this for extended periods of time under chronic self. And so some of these qualities you might never have seen. And though we don't have the animation for the app in the PowerPoint, we do have it in the app, so it would change. So for example, underlying, from underlying to every day, we can see this dial up, but potentially because I'm not that outcome focused, I actually don't speak my mind as much as I want to. So that might be costing my openness and overextended, it just goes all over the place. So then there's different outputs. You can see this in the report. So here's my favorite page. I'm sure you can see the connections to other tools you might've been using as far as this kind of outlook. Then you'd look for particular patterns. So when we look at them together, for example, we can see what we find is that every day is most correlated with performance in 360s. So people think you're good at it because you do it. Surprise, surprise. Underline doesn't particularly measure. So actually, whatever you like underlying, your colleagues probably won't see it and won't affect your performance. But if your underlying is in line with your every day, we call it a strength or a key quality. You're doing what you like. And actually, when this happens, your colleagues tend to rate you as more effective than if you just have it every day. So you're kind of a natural. Sometimes you, so for example, like I like to take charge, I'm quite flexible, spontaneous. Not sure if people here would call that a strength, but I do. And I'm quite radical. Shake things, shake things up, make it happen, do it differently. Then we have conscious efforts. So you're low underlying, you don't like to do it, but you, but you do it. So here we see, for example, intimate listening and one-to-one -one communication. I really want to tell you how I freaking feel about this, but I will try to listen and understand you. You know, working in coaching and people development, you kind of need to listen sometimes. And for example, to me, what really helped to develop this was a Nancy Klein book, More Time to Think, which I highly recommend. And then we can see, for example, uh, 
uh, hidden treasures, qualities which are high underlying, which we don't show up every day. So for example, I'm actually quite observing or I'm quite conceptual. It doesn't show up. So it's interesting. What's, what about the situation that I perceiving that doesn't allow me to show this? Then you have traits which show up only under stress. So to me, it's empathy. So I'm quite logical, a bit like Mr. Spock, according to some people, when it comes to analyzing humans, my favorite subject matter. But under stress, I get all empathetic. So I just go, oh, well, I hope this person is sleeping okay, or I hope their family is okay. And the person next to me is sitting, it's like, what's happening to you? And I go, what? 10 minutes ago, you were fuming about this person and telling me how incompetent they are. You know, well, why is this happening to you? Well, it's because I'm getting stressed, same as I get quite quiet. So it's just some of the patterns to look out for. And then you can dial it up a notch. You can look at both sides. So this is a, and this is still very much work in progress. I'm trying to map what is the research showing onto the model. So we can see that, for example, this is underlying, first line, everyday second, overextended third. So underlying, this person likes to do something. Let, let's say be tough. I know what's right, goddammit, and not particularly diplomatic. But every day they really dial down their tough, like really. And they dial up their accommodating to go, mm -hmm, yes, that is a good idea, while having their teeth clenched. And because that's, they're not getting energy from speaking their mind. And they're spending energy on doing the opposite of what they like. That's a big change, huge. It's like... Uh, and uh, then overextend it, it flips back to type, so to say, because you don't have energy, so you, you refer. But by that time, you've been fuming on something and bubbling away inside of you that you immediately go for the jugular. So it's not already kind of discussion, it's already conflict. And then this person might think, but if I show my tough, it will always be conflict. Well, yeah, because this is what happened in the past, because you keep holding back. The question is, how can you balance this out? And then we have deeply buried treasure. You like to do something, but for some reason you dial it up every day to the opposite, and you also dial up overextension. So that's potentially it's something that needs to work on, like what is happening in your environment that you don't only feel you need to dial it up to every day, but you feel you're doing it too much. So that means there's potentially a situational strength that is so strong, it's really pulling you in the opposite direction. Then, for example, not fast either way, I'm not fast about being radical or cautious. It might be reliable. You just want to get stuff done. It's like, is it new? Is it old? Who cares? Is it effective? Then you might have three preferences underlying every day overextended at 99th percentile and like two, five percentile across here. And then it's like so hard to change. Even whatever the situation demands, your strength is pulling you so much in the opposite direction. So you have coaches like that. If uh, it's for them to want to change. So if somebody is highly accommodating, not at all tough, they do need to stand up for themselves because other people are not psychic and they won't know what they want. So the question is, you have to kind of get it from within. So you need to ask them for them to realize why they want to change. Why is it important and want to do this? Because it's likely to be a very uphill struggle. And in this case, it would be starting with little things like sending food back in restaurants when it's cold or asking for a new hotel room when it's, uh, it's not up to scratch by your standards. And then we'd look like, for example, somebody is normal underlying every day. And by normal, I mean aligned, should have used a different word. And then overextended, they flip in a totally different way. So it's kind of curious. They're used to working like this, and other people are used to working with them like this, and now they're flipped out. It's like, what's happening? Or some people who slowly fall into overextensions by doing the opposite and lose the balance. So, however, it might be all so cool and new, but nothing is new under the moon, as Shakespeare said. So here, for you statistically minded of you, this is the correlations we find in Spark between aspects. So the eight, so here we can see like correlation between big picture thinking and extroversion, 0.46, discipline driven down to 0.54, and the opposites as well. However, what we find what's really curious is it's 0.11 here between people focused and inspiration driven and outcome focused and discipline driven. The model breaks into two. So some of you big five fans, you'd probably go, aha, this is plasticity and stability, the big two. And I'd say, yes, you're right. It is plasticity and stability. So uh, recent studies have shown that actually the big five, there's correlations that break it into two. So extroversion and openness goes together and 
low neuroticism, agreeableness, and conscientiousness goes on the other side, stability. So getting on and getting along. Somebody once said, I think, uh, yeah. And plasticity and stability. Uh, so on plasticity, we have extroversion and openness, big picture, same as you do on the big five, but we also have the opposites of stability. We have the opposite of agreeableness and we have the opposite of conscientiousness. And same in stability, we don't only have uh, agreeableness, people focus and conscientiousness, discipline driven, but we also have the opposite of plasticity, which is down to earth and introversion. So it's nicely combined. And recently I was doing this in a workshop and I was like, this recent study and this recent study. And somebody stood up and said, this is nothing new. And I was like, what, what, what? I mean, <clears throat> I'm so happy you asked me this question. What would they mean about this? And they said, this is yin and yang. And I said, hmm, really? So I went and did a little bit of digging about this and the over extension sides. So yeah, so when we talk about yang, we talk about light, fire, heat, generating, sun, movement, excitatory. And when we talk about ying, it's more about the shadow, water being a bit cooler, growth, moon, rest, inhibitory. Because when people designed this, uh, it was like some people say thousand years ago, other people say it's older, it's hard to find a peer-reviewed reference from thousands of years ago. Um, the main thing is they didn't have too many opposites. They didn't have like a positively and a negatively charged electron. What they had, the positives they could observe in nature, such as night, day heat cold and it's about the opposites and it's about how it's the question is how do you balance the two so they're not opposites per se but it's more about how they complement each other it's how the yang complements the yin and the beauty of this is that the seed of one is carried in the opposite so same as the seed of yang is carried in yin and the seed of yin is carried in yang so you need both for each of them to exist and i think this applies for personality too if we didn't have extroversion, we wouldn't have introversion because that'd be just meh. It just would be it. Same as if we didn't have agreeableness, we wouldn't have disagreeableness, outcome focus. The opposites need each other. We need diversity of personality. And most importantly, we need to value people who see the world differently from us because that's why we're potentially one of the reasons we're so successful as a species. We might look very similar, but actually we see the world slightly differently. And this is why we need to talk about this. And the dangers, I believe, for example, people ask me, Nikita, what makes a successful team? Well, I have no idea, but uh, the inklings that I do have is people who are successful, who I work with and teams who are successful, might not have all the quadrants covered. They might not have only a mix, equal mix of extroverts, outcome focus, people focus, but they see the value of the opposite. And what I mean by this, that I'll just go back a slide. So here you can see that the language has changed on the outside. And what Lumina does, it makes a point of how the others might see you. So for example, somebody who is highly people focused, under stress, might see outcome focus, they see conflict, they won't see that person is tough. They will see the see conflict part, the maladaptive form, win at all costs rather than competitive and argumentative rather than logical. I'm sure some of you logical there would appreciate it. You say to somebody why they're wrong and they say, you're being argumentative. And, and, and you say, I'm not. And they say, well, here you go. And you're just like, there's no way winning with you. And the issue becomes if you have too much of one, they start seeing only the negative and the other. Such as if you have a lot of people focused people, they will see the outcome focused as being, well, I'm not sure I can use the explicit on this call, but sure some names come to mind people who only take care of their own needs same as people who only get here if they hurt somebody's feelings they will just say well john you know bob over there seems a bit upset i didn't do anything wrong no 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 bill you know she's just really sensitive let's send them to hr and uh, that's when it becomes a problem when you have polarization of personality and you lose this balance and uh, yin and yang does say it's a dynamic and it's always changing. And you have overextensions of it as well. If you have too much of this plasticity, you get chaos. If you have too much stability, you get frozen. And, and I find this in organizations as well. I feel there's a very strong social bias right now towards plasticity. Innovation, disruptors, hackers, all this stuff you see on LinkedIn, growth mindset. And I always say, 
A potato has a gross mindset. You take a potato, you shove it in a cupboard, take it out a month later, it has grown in all the opposite directions. But what's the point? You ruin the good potato. So the thing is that you need both the, the plant, the seed, and you also need the soil. And organizations which I find work well is when they have the balance between the two. You have innovation, but it's driven by reality. And then this innovation is integrated into actual implementation. And like I have a little rhyme that impl uh, innovation, that's plasticity, without implementation, which is stability, does not lead to manifestation. So you need both, and they're dynamic and they're changeable, and it's all very interesting. Oh, yeah. One second. Yeah. So personality is dynamic. We adapt to our environment and people around us. The question is what cost to ourselves and others? New psychometrics can show these dynamics in unprecedented ways. And maybe personality dynamics will be the next big thing in personality. You have your references. So thank you for your time and attention. If you have any questions, please raise your hand, and I would be very keen to hear from you. We have five minutes for discussion. Fantastic, Nikita. Thank you so much. I'm literally just looking. If anyone does have any questions, you can use the chat feature at the bottom. Or you can use the raise your hand feature as well. So do say if you have any questions and we can address them now. What a wonderfully expressive talk. OK, we've got someone who's got their hand up. Let's go. Oh, no, they put their hand down. <laughs> I see. Just a little thinking. Oh, well, thank you, <laughs> Anuka. And uh, yes, the references are interesting. And please uh, uh, go to Google Scholar and type in some of the things I've been talking about. And uh, I'd highly recommend also Timothy Judge website. He has all the lovely references. Uh, he publishes all his articles as well as his presentation on the website, and it's lovely. If any of you have any questions about personality or Spark or anything like this, feel free to um, contact me on LinkedIn or send me an email. What are your new? Oh, Jan de Jorg asking me if there, I have any New Year resolutions. I don't because New Year resolutions are not likely to work because usually people who set them are low in conscientiousness in the first place. And, uh, and, if you, and it's probably something you haven't been able to do for a whole year. So you like have not been able to do anything for 2017 and then you want to do it every day, not likely to work. You need to improve 0.01% a week, I believe. <laughs> Oh, I wonder what this Apollo 13 event that, oh, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> yes, Chris, get your reference. Excellent. And I think I should have my, do I have my email around here? Nah, I don't. Oops. Lovely. So, any more questions? Interesting, we've got one more second ago. Oh. Okay, so, uh, Robin, that's a wonderful question. So, talking about neuroticism, in the beginning, I also wondered this, but actually what now gives me an indication of neuroticism is, one second, sorry to flip through. Yeah, so Spark, uh, Lumina designed a different tool called Lumina Emotion, which looks at uh, neuroticism or as we call it risk reactor, reward reactor, uh, which can be used to uh, give additional information. But in my practice, I feel I get most of what I need from Spark. And the way that neuroticism comes out in Spark is overextended questions and to what extent the person claimed them. So because one of the key things about neuroticism and personality is that people who are highly neurotic have a negative attitude towards their own self-construct. So they don't particularly like who they are, as they are. And therefore, uh, they are more likely to respond to negatively worded items. So to me, a good indication that I am neurotic if I was looking at my profile is that my biggest splash whoops, is my overextended. So I, I, I strongly, the strongest items I identified was, was the overextended. When I said, I'm not doing something, I'm not doing too many favors to myself. My behavior is not the best. So I was I identified the strongest with negatively worded items. And that's a good indication of N. 
I believe the correlation between overextended items and neuroticism is 0.7 or 0.8. We actually did a little study, and therefore it does give you a certain amount of extent. What's also really curious to me about neuroticism is, uh, is to what extent your personality changes between underlying and everyday. So if your underlying and everyday is very different and your overextended is really big, which this a good indication of neuroticism because of I, I think if we go to original definition of neuroticism, it's unresolved internal conflict. And if your behavior is opposite to your preference and overextended, you go all over the place. That could be a good indication. I hope that energy is this. How can introverted manage having to produce in an extrovert environment? Tracy, that's a wonderful question. I always say that an introvert is just an extrovert with good taste. Uh, and uh, and the question is, what are they passionate about? What they're interested about? One thing to be aware of between introversion and extroversion is research on cortical arousal. And cortical arousal is how much stimuli does your brain actually need from your senses and be you know, hearing or taste or whatever, uh, from your senses in order to feel engaged with the world. Surprisingly enough, extroverts have a higher threshold. They literally need more stimuli from their environment than introverts. So what environment extroverts might find stimulating so music bar drink food all of it together loud company it's stimulating for them it's engaging but for an introvert it's overwhelming it's like good indication somebody's an introvert if you say let's go to a party and they say well after a couple of drinks i'll be fine uh it's potentially because their cortical arousal level is dampened through alcohol i'm not encouraging self-medication here that's not the way to do it it's to be mindful of the amount of stimuli and it's to find like i find introverts for example can present as long as extroverts don't interrupt them so to make sure that if you're introverted and you're presenting you're presenting at the time you want and you feel most strongest if it's in the morning make the meeting in the morning make it clear that you're going to speak and then questions don't interrupt so you can tell your story and take people with you and be aware to get times to regenerate. So if you literally schedule half an hour to an hour during the day where you can go to your place in which you regenerate and your energy goes up, whatever it be, walk in the park, sit by a pond, uh, uh, listen to your favorite music, everybody got something. Um, and I highly recommend a TED talk called The Confessions of Passionate Introvert by Brian Little. I hope that answers your question. Uh, I'd like to know about your thoughts about the concept of gamification. So that's a wonderful question about uh, gamification. So um, Chanel is asking my thoughts on gamification of assessments and the big five. So gamification is a really new thing and it's really cool and it's really exciting. It's only a couple of years old. What I've been talking about, like big five is existing for at least like 60 to 70 years in one form or another. So and self-report as well. So right now we are in a new era and there is some really interesting research is coming up. I believe you had a good talk by Arctic Shores and it's recorded, is it right? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's good talks about that. There's also a really good talk by Ben Williams from Stan Tan on gamification. If you just search for it on LinkedIn, it should come up. And he actually did a study well, he did a lit review on all the studies of the correlations between Big Five gamification, gamification and performance. He contacted all the publishers to see what data they would be willing to release. And it's a really, really good, solid piece of work. And uh, feel free to connect with Ben Williams on uh, LinkedIn and just ask him to send your presentation directly. I'm sure he'll be happy to do so. Any other questions? Did we miss one just before? Let's just double check. Oh, yes. Oh, more, uh, Joel, sorry, I missed your question. So uh, the question is, are any of the three states of underlying everyday overextended more or less stable over time? Well, this is where we come to the wonderful test retest uh, concept of reliability. And our test retest over the three personas is within the BPS guidelines of 0.7 and above. Some are more stable than others. Uh, there's some slight differences between over uh, underlying every day and overextended, but ever so slight. We're doing some additional research on this. Uh, maybe we need to take factor in that people's circumstances have changed rather than profiling people in the same job six months and before and after. 
So I'll keep, uh, if you connect with me, I'll keep you updated about it. Uh, to me, the change is important. Like, I'll just go from one little last story before we finish. I had a psychologist call me who done a spark one year between. She says, Nikita, this tool is absolutely rubbish. What are you doing with this company? Why don't you use like reputable big five tools? I said, mm, why, why such a strong reaction? She said, look, I've done a Spark a year ago, and uh, now I've done it again, and my profiles are completely different. And I go, well, this deserves a coffee. So we met, and the app, Luminous Splash, you can download it from the App Store or Google Play, allows you to scan in profiles. So we scanned in her current one and her old one and overlaid them. Her underlying splashes were identical. A year ago, her underlying in every day was very in line and her overextended practically did not exist. Now, her underlying barely translated in her everyday and her everyday was the opposite of her underlying and overextended was very much present. And then I asked her, well, what happened? And she went through like huge organizational changes in the last year. And she says, is this indication I'm stressed? And I said, are you stressed? She says, yeah, out of my box. And I said, well, okay, now we can deal with this. So it wasn't about the tool. So it's, it's exactly an illustration of that this changes in personality over time deserve attention rather than being brushed under the surface. And with our work, especially if you work one-to-one -one, rather than data analytics, or if you're working with teams, it's to keep this in mind that everybody is different and everybody is dynamic and potentially this personality dynamics is kind of a, a meta factor of personality itself. Any other questions? Wonderful. Okay. So Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Nikita, for that. That's been very insightful. And um, yes, we have got a recording, so hopefully it has come out all right, and we'll post it um, onto the group and other platforms as well. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a super weekend. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.